Uh, we're recording, so I guess so. Welcome to Bat Lessons. <laughs> you just gotta look at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Bat Lessons. The okay. Batman History Podcast. Yeah. You uh, caught us around Thanksgiving again, which yeah. apparently is just the time we get together in person. It seems to be. Unusual occurrence, because we actually live on opposite sides of the country now. Mm-hmm. And thought we should take advantage and record less prepared than normal. Mm-hmm. Intentionally so. I normally have like one, you know, five to like 15 pages of notes. I have like half page of notes. Uh, so hopefully it goes well, even though I'm not really prepped at all. Yeah, what are we talking about today? So we're talking about Clayface, mm-hmm. um, a, I think kind of a fun sneak behind the curtain or whatever, peek mm. behind the curtain, is that we we try and shoot for like an hour yeah. in our episodes. <laughs> they're always two. And they're getting longer <laughs> yeah. as we're trying to be shorter. And yeah. so this time we're kind of like letting the pendulum swing the other way, doing a lot more like off the cuff stuff sure. after doing some research so yeah. um, usually what happens is alex has like his script mm-hmm. he has a whole bunch of points that he wants to talk about and then i'm familiar with the concept i do some youtube videos yeah. or something so that i can pepper in some thoughts and then that that come that merges pretty well so this time you've got half a page of notes just a couple things i want to make sure i hit i've watched know? like a third as much stuff as i normally would and we're just going to hit this one off the cuff and it's a test we're going to see if it works well if we like it yeah if we don't this episode may never see the light of day <laughs> it's true <laughs> if it's okay um then then we'll iterate and we'll, we'll it do. would make my life easier because i so we just last night had the dr connery interview which mm-hmm. went fantastic it went really um, well yeah but because of that and the fact that we already recorded the December episode, I've got like three and a half hours of material to, that I need to edit now. Mm-hmm. And so maybe editing this will be, be easier. What do you, what do you know about Clayface? So I, I know what Clayface looks like um, okay. <laughs> in that, in that Clayface is a shapeshifter. Uh-huh. I know that some kind of uh, accident created Clayface and it's kind of reminiscent to that Sandman mm-hmm. from Marvel, mm-hmm. right? In, in concept that, some kind of construction type accident kind of mm. a situation where you can morph into whoever you want. I know that in many versions of Clayface, they are an actor because they yeah. want to portray any role. So those are like the high level, like, let's get started on Clayface. So yeah, it, when it comes to DC Comics, they've had numerous reboots, right? So mm-hmm. they had uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths was one of the big ones, New 52 is another one of the big mm-hmm. ones, but they have like many reboots all the time. And there are certain characters that remain basically the same. So, like, we, we talked about Batman. You know, we, we've got, like, Frank Miller coming in in the 80s and saying, everything's the same. Don't worry. Year one, like, yeah, he changes it a bit, but it's, like, it's still Batman. Like, yeah, yeah. Murder in the Alley, you know, what is it, uh, Cowardly and the uh, Superstitious Lot, you yeah, know, totally. hit, mm-hmm. hit all the beats. He's still Batman. Um, Clayface, much like Hawkman, I don't know if you're familiar with Hawkman, there's a yeah. few that are... For whatever reason, they never really hit their stride in terms of, like, everyone agrees that this is what Clayface is. So when we talk about Clayface, there's, like, eight of them, right? And they have different names and different backstories and different... It is true that I think the one that's most popular now, the one that's sort of, like, caught on, I think, is is an actor. The reason we're doing Clayface now is because he was created in 1940. So right there at the very beginning, Bob Kane is still involved. Very, very soon here, he's going to peel off and start working on the newspaper strip instead of the comic books. But at this time, he's still involved and participating, uh, uh, you know, in the creation of characters. And so it's uh, Detective Comics number 40. He appears. We'll, we'll summarize that story in a bit. But the, the, the I, you know, doing research in all of my books, I couldn't find any quotes at all. There are indirect quotes. There's lots of people that say that Bob Kane's on the record about the creation of Clayface, but I couldn't find anything personally. It probably exists somewhere. I just, you know, didn't dig hard, hard enough. But he's even more so than some of the characters we've talked about. Like we said, Catwoman's not all that important in the Golden Age. He's even less important. So he appears mm-hmm. in Detective Comics 40 and 49 and then doesn't appear again until the 60s. So, um, well, there's one other thing that's yeah. kind of interesting. So you're, you're talking about why we chose Clayface. Sure, next. sure, sure, sure. So um, two things. This one, I know that Clayface is one of Alex's favorite characters. Yes. Um, so I, I've been eager to dive into Clayface in general so we can kind of break the ice and, and do some more with Clayface. And then second is I had made a uh, observation, I guess, in a previous episode 
that most of the uh, characters that have stuck around for a long time are probably the ones that are wholly human and not mystical in any way. So, like, Penguin is human, the mm. Joker is human, yeah. Catwoman is human, and the idea that they showed up in the 30s or 40s and have lasted since then is is because of that, but other characters were more, like, mystical, like, sure. say, Clayface uh-huh. or um, Killer Croc, sure. would, Killer come much, would come much later, yeah. is my hypothesis, and then I did some looking and I see that Clayface shows up really early. Yeah. He's before Two Face. He's before Two Face. Before Penguin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And but there there is an interesting element of like how Clayface shows up originally versus what we're more familiar right. with. In the same way that Catwoman changed over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why we're in in here now. Right. That's the thing is that like I like Clayface, but I'm not I don't like, like I, the gold, Golden Age Clayface is not my Clayface. You read the story, right? No. Oh, you haven't read it. Okay. So I'm... I I read an overview of the story to get an idea of the <laughs> intro, Fair but enough. I haven't read it. Okay. So, yeah, in the Golden Age, she's um, uh, Basil Carlo is uh-huh. his name, right? And we'll read the story in a minute, but the gist is he's an actor who is spurned, right? And then mm-hmm. does yeah, He does keeps crimes. trying to get uh, uh, get roles, and he's told that he's too tall or too short. He doesn't have the right look. No? No, so... Is it a different one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, in, the for- in Detective Comics number 40, uh-huh. the gist is that he was a famous actor, mm-hmm. and he was in... Uh, We'll, we'll read the book in a minute, but like okay. in like horror movies and he gets older, he has some bad press. They don't really say what, like, you know, uh, I, I, maybe some drunken disorderlies. I don't know. But like, for whatever reason, people don't go see his movies anymore. So they're remaking one of his movies. Oh, and that's it's with a different right. actor. And yeah. He's mad that he's they're mad. not reusing him. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. I remember this now. And he just puts on makeup. So he doesn't shapeshift. He doesn't have any powers. He's not supernatural. So to hear you say like, right. Yeah. 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 So golden age, uh, much more grounded in the 1960s. We get Matt Hagen. Matt Hagen is the name That's that you, I was thinking of. you yeah. might be familiar with now, but he, here's the deal in the comics in the sixties, Matt Hagen is a treasure hunter who like dives down in a cave, mm-hmm. falls in a pool. Yeah. He, he finds, finds an interesting thing that, that he, it's a... It looks like rainbow liquid on the ground. Right. Like he finds an air pocket in the cave. He goes in. He submerges himself in the pool. Yeah. And then he can shapeshift. And he's... And, and But like originally he's upset. He just wants to look like what he used to look like. I don't remember. And then, yeah. and then he manages to uh, get enough expertise, I guess. Over... He uses concentration, I think. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then he looks like himself again. He's like, oh, this is really cool. What else can I do? And, and starts to realize Turns he into horses look and stuff. like anything. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uses this newfound power to turn to crime. Not an actor. Uh, doesn't really share any elements with the the Basil Carlo. But what was I going to say? There. So speaking of like grounded. Oh, the... I remembered it. Okay. He has to return to the pool every twenty four hours um, or forty eight oh, hours. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. So, that, so the thing is, like, he the, they have to create a limit. If you have a fantastic power, you have to have some sort of limit, right? This uh-huh. is the, the very sixties sort of thing, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so they, they got to have the kryptonite to the Superman or whatever, and mm. then just as he has to return to the pool every forty eight hours, or he he can't shapeshift anymore. That's the original Matt Hagen got limitation. Him. So he's the first shapeshifter. It's the one from the sixties. Interesting. This kind of reminiscent, different, but reminiscent of. Uh, r- r- Ra's al Ghul or Ra's al Ghul, however you pronounce it. Sure, 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 sure. And he can live forever, but he has to do the resurrection the, pit thing. The Lazarus pit. Lazarus pit, that's what it's mm-hmm. called. Yeah. But the Clayface that I knew originally mm-hmm. was the anime series. Sure. And in the anime series, which was early 90s, he was called Matt Hagen as well. But he was a different Matt Hagen. Yeah. He was basically, he was more like Basil Carlo from the Golden Age. He was an actor who, um, let me see if I've got notes here. Uh, he suffer. Oh, that's right. He suffers an accident, and like his face gets all disfigured, and he's like, "Oh, I'm never gonna be able to act act again." He's really distraught, mm-hmm. and this dude shows up and is like, "Hey, I've got this miracle drug. It's called Renew You, and if you see it in writing, it's like RNU. I don't know why, and it will make you look the way you were before, or make you look however you want." And he takes the drug, and it's like, "Oh, it's true." So you can have as much of this drug as you want, but you have to do crimes for us. So he's kind of getting coerced into a life of crime. Yeah. And the just with his, this Matt Hagen, his limitation is that he can only stay transformed for so long. So like if he's, you know, more more than an hour, more than two hours, he has to change back to being clay. And that's the version that basically becomes the the de facto clay face. Yeah. It, although it changes. So like in the new fifty two in the comics, they align the comics with the 
I mean, anime series, and they basically give him the exact same backstory, but he's named Basil Carlo, not Matt Hagen. Oh, okay. So that's the one that I like as well. Uh, one of my favorite comic book runs uh, recently, the Rebirth era, so like 2016 Detective Comics run, written by James Tynion the Fourth, which he always jokes that his Detective Comics run is his X Men run, right? Like it's a, it's a team book, and like Batman's not as important, and like Batwoman's kind of leading the leading the crew, and Clayface joins. That's right. I, I did run that. across how how Clayface has turned turned to good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think what 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 always works really well for me about the character is that it's someone that has expectation of him to be a certain way or to be someone is not super happy with the way they look or maybe the way they act and finds themselves sort of shape shifting to like fit into different environments and like is is he a criminal? I don't know. He does crime. Is he, you know, an actor? And that's like, yeah, he's portraying different people. But like, you know, good person, bad person. Is he a hero? Is he, you know? And it's yeah. very much like he's... The motivation, right? Yeah. He's a little lost. He's a little kind of a leaf on the wind. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, I think everyone feels that way sometimes. But like, it kind of sp speaks to me as a, or spoke to me when I was a teenager. Sure. <laughs> right? So um, I think that that's why I like Clayface is that, is that you know, his, his power, his gist, his deal is, is a reflection of his sort of mental state. You know his, yeah. his uh, social perception of the world. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty deep, right? I think it's kind of an, an interesting, like it's it's a superpower in that like other villains have powers or they have tricks or whatever. Yeah, his this is like a superpower. Mm. Um, it's just like what how how it's being used, and I think it is a, a relatable one, but might not be one that you would choose. Like you're with your friends, and you're like, oh, what what superpower would you choose? Mm. Would, it would healing or flying or sure. Whatever, I don't think people would necessarily, or invisibility, I don't think people would choose like shape shifting, but it is like a really um, powerful asset, a powerful totally. tool. Um, and in fact, I think in some versions of Clayface, down to the DNA level, it's a match and mm. he wreaks havoc on um, Bruce Wayne, not knowing that is Batman, mm. but um, is having fun as a billionaire, but like ruining Bruce Wayne's like whole <laughs> reputation stuff. I don't know if I know that story, that's yeah. good. I did see another one, uh, kind of off, off topic, but I did see another one where he uh, was going to do a favor for the penguin so that he could get access to a uh, chemical. It's kind of like Renew You, but it's a, um, it's uh, Skinwalkers, mm -mm -mm. the ancient um, Native American uh, shape-shifting belief. And mm -hmm. he was like, oh, Isn't this... that like an urban legend, though? Like, that's not, is that actually a thing, or is that... Uh, I... I um yeah yes okay i, I thought it was exactly. like a creepypasta thing like it i'm gonna close the window a little bit oh see. sure um i don't actually know what the like the historicity of that is but yeah. like no i don't believe anyone shape-shifting <laughs> um. sure <laughs> fair enough <laughs> i just didn't know if it was actually a native american thing or not or if that was... oh yeah I, I don't i don't totally know okay um, i know there's like the people who believe in like ufos also probably believe in sure skinwalker ranch specifically because that's where a lot of that like shape shifting lore came from, and the... is that like Skywalker Ranch? No, I don't think it's supposed to be like that. It's, I feel like you know more about like, this than I do. Uh, it's it's on like Montana or something, okay. but they, there's weird lights and unexplainable things. Okay. It, it to me, it kind of reminds me of like the mystery spot where it's like yes. there's like there's, there's a trap. whole lot of BS around. Can it you explain to, like... to people what the mystery spot is because they don't know? Sure. So the mystery spot, um, and there, there's several of them, but there's a famous one um, where around where we used to live in, in the Bay Area of California. And San Cruz. I lived like 10 minutes from it. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's all based on like illusions. Like there, here's a ball rolling uphill and um, these... It's a fun house. It's, yeah. But, it, but it's all like, it, to, to me, it always struck me as like, Someone got a really crappy plot of land, mm -hmm. but they were also a marketing genius, and sure. so they like took a, a, a it's challenge. A tourist trap. They they took a challenge, turned into an opportunity. Uh -huh. It's a tourist trap, yeah. but it's like fun. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they used to do is they would just like slap mystery spot bumper stickers on every car in the parking lot yes. without permission. Uh, that changed over time, but now um, people buy them and they put them on their cars, and you see mystery spot stickers all over the place. Um, but it's like nothing. There's no product there. It's just like it's an illusion. It's entertainment. Right. You go. There's, you pay forty dollars. They give you a tour of a, of a bunch of optical illusions. Yeah, yeah it's all optical illusions. Yeah. Um, and so like the Skinwalker Ranch thing, it seems like a similar idea in that there's nothing there, um, but some people are making like a whole lot of money sure. on this on the propagation, I guess, of this mm -hmm, urban mm -hmm. legend. Sorry. 
How do bring we it back? There? Yes, yes, yes. Bring it back to Batman. <laughs> okay. The Skinwalkers, the the um, urban legend around that is that there is a um, special group of American Indians that were able to shape shift into anything they wanted to, mm. um, to do good or bad or whatever. But it was like protecting their tribe, and that bottled is what the penguin had to give to this dude. Mm. And this dude wanted it, I think because he was an actor and wanted to be able to portray any any role. Um, but the penguin was like, well, to get this, you need to do this thing for me. And he did that. He got it. He became Clayface. Interesting. What is, mm. is, is that a Comic-Con to do anything? Or is that a, like a... Well, yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> there's, there's many versions, right? So that's yeah. the thing. Is that like, I think it's like seven or eight different named characters. We, we were just talking about the most popular ones, so. Let's see what Clayface, Skinwalker, Penguin, and Google gets me. <laughs> and that's pretty much all I had in notes. Um, and we, we can do the story afterwards. I, I know there was, there was something Batman Beyond as well. Yeah, so I was going to talk a little bit about Batman Beyond because that's a show that I I have enjoyed. I mean, it's, it's a kind of a continuation on Batman the Animated Series, except that Bruce Wayne is old and um, he finds this kid who... Terry McGinnis. Yeah, um, whose dad was a police officer that, Don't ask or me. something like that, <laughs> passed away, ang- angry, not quite orphan, um, like he has his mom and stuff, but like ang- angry kid, and it turns out he has a lot of Batman-like abilities. and Trains him to be Batman. He, yeah, trains him to be Batman, and in that, it's kind of interesting because it's all like super futuristic, like mm-hmm. lasers and hoverboards and all sorts of cool stuff like that, um, but they have to like reimagine the villains because they're not old Batman villains. They have to be new Batman villains. Right. Everyone's dead. They got old or died. Right. It's like 50 years later or whatever. Right. And so there's this character named Ink. It's I-N-Q-U-E and very reminiscent of Clayface to me. Just travels like a liquid and then can take on any form. Generally a black blob. But it's a female character. I, I don't remember their original name. There is this particular plot point where there's this guy who basically like falls in love with Ink and and wants to have the same powers that she has. And he, uh, Aaron, and Ink is like, yeah, I can get this for you here. This is the chemical composition and it's in this special lab. And if you get me there, then I can get you to be like me. And he was like, oh my God, yes, please. Mm. And basically it's, a, it's kind of a bait and switch where she used his abilities to get into a place where she needed access to something else entirely. Mm. And then uh, the chemical is like, completely out of control and it basically just turns into like a, a blob like those those fish at the bottom of the sea that when they come <laughs> up they look like a blob fish or whatever yeah this is what this dude looked like at the end of this and and it's just it's a really sad story for the guy but ink i think is a, a strong uh, descendant descendant yeah, yeah of clayface Gotcha. Uh, I, I I mean to watch Batman Beyond at some point. I haven't had a chance to, but... Okay, so the, the quote that I couldn't find from, that, from Bob Kane about Clayface mm-hmm. was that he was inspired by Lon Chaney. Lon Chaney? Yeah. Really? Uh, it's specifically the Phantom of the Opera. Oh, okay. um, And when you see his art here in a second in, in his costume, you'll, you'll kind of see it. Lon mm-hmm. Chaney, I believe... So that I get them all mixed up. Boris Karloff, who's part of... Basil Carlo, that's part of where the name comes from. Really? Yes. That's cool. Was Frankenstein yep. in the Universal Monster movies. Mm-hmm. Lon Chaney, also a participant in the Universal Monster movies, was he the one that was the man who laughs? I think he was. Can you look that, Google that for me? I'm going to Google it. Hunchback of Notre Dame, the Phantom of the Opera. Those are the things that are... Okay, 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 okay. Oh, his ability to transform himself using makeup techniques that he developed earned him the nickname, the man with a thousand faces. Yeah. Got it. So that makes sense. So that's the deal is he's a, he's a actor that is, you know, Don's makeup mm-hmm. and can ch- sort of change his face. Anyway, you get the vibe when we read the story that that's what he's inspired by is like 1920s, 1930s Hollywood is sure. sort of the vibe. And, and that would make sense. Yes. Um, so here, I'll hand you my, my iPad. And then you've got the actual book. I have the, um, omnibus. the omnibus. Yeah. Which by the way, the colors in the Omni for this are way better than they are in DC Universe Infinite. I have no idea why. Huh. The the sort of scan or restoration that is on DC Universe's Garbo. This num- number 40 is yes. is the Clayface one? Yes, but see here's the deal. They so we cut that episode. Yeah. We never released it so they don't know that we know this cover. 
Oh, right. Okay. We can talk about it if you want. Sure. Well, so so the important thing about this, so looking at the cover, we've got Robin is is hanging out on like a flagpole. Um, he's in dire straits or whatever. And we've got some dude in like a suit and a hat. Um, he looks like he's wearing some kind of a mask. He's got a hatchet and he's trying to like cut off the flagpole mm -hmm. so that Robin falls to his death. And Batman is there, like, holding the hatchet. Yeah. And so in this other episode that we, we talked about is we kind of were putting things together and discovered that this cover has nothing to do with the inside of this right. book. Right. This, this is a moment from Batman number one. And it's the Joker, right? Yes. Yeah. So the dude with the hatchet is the Joker. Yeah. And if you go online and you watch, like, videos of people talking about Clayface, and they'll talk about Detective Comics number 40, people will say that this is Clayface, but that's incorrect. That's, yeah, right. This, this moment is, is from Clayface. the second story, second Joker story in Batman number one, the fifth story in the book. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. But it's also kind of fun, because this is Detective Comics, and it's referencing a thing in Batman number one. That's right. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. So if you're, if you're, like, a super fan at this point, you're calling back, you're like, oh, sh snap, like... <laughs> Good catch. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> what happens when you got a three-year-old? That's so cool, like that they're they're calling back or whatever. Yeah, and we we had this revelation once before on a on an episode of Judging by the Cover that ended up not. I don't know if we're going to bring back Judging by the Cover. We'll see. Yeah, we had real a lot of fun with Chief Shives, uh, but it it is difficult to coordinate guests and mm -hmm. got some feedback that there was a lot of covers, which on an audio podcast. Yeah, not the best. If you got feedback or if you have ideas, let us know. Throw them in the comments. We read all of them. We have multiple people who have agreed to become on the show guests that mm -hmm. I would love to have. That we need to make sure it's the right format. So and scheduling is challenging. Yes, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we open uh, again on the title page mm -hmm. that introduces the Batman story because again, like in Detective Comics, there's like a bunch of other stuff, right? So this is the first page of the Batman. We see a scene where again Robin's in peril. And there's a man sort of in a, a purple, I don't know, get up. <laughs> He's got a long cape and a, a wide brim hat who's holding a dagger above Robin and, and Batman swooping in. But they're in a castle. They're in a castle. And it does look a lot like the dude on the cover. It is, but it's not. Right. So this is Clayface. I know. But, that's, <laughs> but I, I can see where the confusion comes from. Yeah. Looks a ton like the dude on the cover. But yeah. it's not. This dude has a cape and he's different color. I don't know if he's purple for you. I know the colors are all screwed up for you. It's it's like a purplish. Okay. You know, li lilac, I'd call it. Yeah. So we start the story and Batman is getting dressed up. He's straightening his tie. He's talking to Robin. Mm -hmm. and he says, you know, my fiance has been cast in a movie and she's going to become a movie star. Hey, isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. And this is back when Bruce Wayne had a fiance. Yeah. Julie Madison. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the gist is that, that Batman's going to go visit. Bruce is going to visit and see the set. So he goes and he's meeting the, the Argus Motion Picture Company. It's the name of the studio. And he's meeting the head, Mr. Bentley, the head of the studio. And they're talking about uh, this movie that they're shooting. It's called Dread Castle. And they've hired this new star, Kenneth Todd, is the name Got of the, the new guy. Mm -hmm. Right? And he's introducing Bruce to Kenneth Todd. You know, in the they're remaking a movie. Dread Castle had previously, which happened a lot, right? We talked about Dracula. Yep. There was a silent one. There was a talky one, right? Mm -hmm. They're remaking the movie, and originally it was played by, you know, ba you know the great character actor, Basil Carlo. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, Todd is is uh, reprising the role. Mm -hmm. Not reprising. I don't know what the right word is. Replacing him. And Basil Carlo walks in the door. He says, hey, did somebody say my name? Uh, and the, the head of the studio is like, oh, Basil. Uh, I just watched, you know, stopped by to wish my successor luck. I hope you are as smart and as foolish as I was. Todd says, like, oh, thanks, Mr. Carlo. So, well, and, and the guy is like, and after Carlo leaves, he's like, what What did Carlo mean by smart and foolish? What was that about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, which I don't, I also don't know really what they mean, but. But, I mean, there, there is, it's it's creating the tension between yes, these yes, two, yes, yes. right? Like it's he's definitely helping. taking a swipe at him somehow. Yeah, and, and it was not missed, right? He, he. The, he was taking a swipe, and the guy he was swiping at received, this is a swipe. Yes, yes, right? yes, yes, yeah. yes. So there's tension on both ends that they're starting to build. And then the studio head, later, Carlo leaves, the studio head's explaining to Bruce, like, the people wouldn't go to see his pictures even if they gave away prizes. That's why they had to recast. Um, and then we just get, like, the next few pages is, is just um, different people coming to, to the studio. And, and the purpose of this... There's two, I think there's two, two cells here that are important, too, is is where Carlo is saying, like, ah, so I'm fired, huh? 
And uh, I I won't forget this, Bentley. I won't forget this. This is, so this is not Carlo. What am I looking at? Who is this? The guy with the orange hair. Mm -hmm. His ne name is Ned Norton. Oh. So bear with me here. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Th this, for the record, this story is bad. It's very hard to follow. I'm, um, I'm trying to <laughs> right now. Yeah. There's, so, I'm amazed at how much text there is on yeah. this, in this comic. So, yeah, we've done like three panels is it for now. And so, and, and the purpose is we're going to cycle through like three or four different people to make them suspects. Oh, so I they, see. So they see. want it to be a whodunit. So right now they've got, they've shown you Carlo. Okay. He's got reason to be upset because he was replaced. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this is Ned Norton. He was the director, but he didn't show up to work. He got fired. So right. he's talking to the head of the studio. Hey, you can't fire me. And he's like, you got to freaking work, dude. Yeah. You, you, sh you disappear for days. Right. I want to know why. And then he, he disappears. Three panels. They bring him in. The, the whole point is like, okay, it's someone who's also angry at the studio. Got it. Carlo's angry at the studio. studio. Norton's angry at the studio. They go out to the set. They built a castle. Uh, you know, head at the studio saying, no expense was spared. Got and... a John Hammond moment there. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't get that joke, but I get that it should be funny. Uh, it's Jurassic Park. He, oh, he yes, yes, yes. He says yes. over and over, we spared no expense. We yes, spared no expense. Exactly. And then it all falls down. <clears throat> and they're shooting uh, the scene and the, the, the star, Lorna Dane, it's this woman in this red dress mm -hmm. of the movie is having a fight with her boyfriend, right? Yeah. So it, it's, you know, between cuts or whatever. And you, the, Vixen, I ought to kill you. Yeah, yeah. You don't deserve to live. So it's, that's a, it's a suspicious thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. This I'm guy's name you. is Fred Walker. He's also an actor. So mm -hmm. it's a, they're, they're a power couple, star couple. They break up. So we observe that. So now we have a third person who has motive. Yeah. Okay. Fred Walker, Norton, Carlo. Uh, Bruce continues his tour, right? Um, and he says, you know, they're getting ready to leave. He thanks the head of the studio. Uh, it was really enjoyable. And then another guy shows up. It's a dude that looks like, uh, kind of a, a gangster, a goon. Mm -hmm. And, um, his name is Roxy Brunner. He's asking for protection money. Yeah, I see that. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is a fourth guy, bad actor. He's coming in and saying, give me the protection money at the studio. Just a quick pause. Yeah. I think it's funny in these golden age where it's like so explicit. Off you gangster! Off you lot! <laughs> I refuse to pay you protection money. Well, the kids they, have to know. They want to make finger. sure. Yeah. I mean, it's so transparent. Like yes. it is. Like they're beating you over the head to make sure you understand what's happening. Yeah. Later that night, Bruce is telling Robin something strange. There's bad energy. Yeah. Bad juju. Something's mm -hmm. gonna happen. A few days later, Bruce comes back to the set. He's watching them film. And they, we've got the Hunchback of Notre Dame, it looks like, basically. They're calling yeah. it Dread Castle, and they're not calling it Hunchback of Notre Dame, but there's a dude dressed like Hunchback. Yep. And he's getting ready to kill Lorna Dane's character in the movie. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the scene that they're shooting. Right. And as he goes to do it, this, this mysterious man in this purple getup cuts the lights. Right? He says, fools, they play at murder, not realizing that I do not pretend, but I shall in reality bring death. That's right. Turns the lights off, kills Lorna Dane. Turns the light back on. Everyone's like, what the heck happened? We were filming a movie. There it's was a clue. fake death. It's kind of like Clue, yeah. yeah. They want it to be a whodunit. Yeah. And then the main actress is dead. And so you as the reader, not knowing who Basil Carlo is, I was like, who could it be? Mm -hmm. It could be Ned Norton, the director. It could be the jilted boyfriend. It could be, it could be the, the gangster. Roxy Brunner. I mean, sp like immediately before <laughs> the gangster says, okay, Bentley, it's your funeral, but don't right. blame me if anything happens to one of your stars. <laughs> yeah. And then the, and the next page, one of the stars dies. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it could be any of these fools. Julie's upset. She's like, hey, I'm going to be the next one to die. And Bruce is like, no, 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 it's going to be okay. And he gets Robin and he's like, we got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And so they go and they find... They go back to the studio. Roxy Brunner's come again. And he's like, hey, someone just died. You better give me protection money if you want to be protected. Mm -hmm. And so they beat the crap out of the gangsters. Brunner's there with some goons, right? Basically, he's Batman at the end of beating the crap out of these guys. He's got Brunner by the, the neck. And he says, you know, talk. Did you kill Lorna Dane? And he says, no, I swear. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to cash in on the murder. I'm like taking advantage of the situation, but I didn't do it. And Batman kicks him in the butt and says, don't come back. Right? And he's talking to the head of Argus and yeah. he's like, um, I'm going to clean up the mystery for you. Like, I don't think it was him. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep looking into it. And Batman and Robin get in the Batmobile. Although it's not the Batmobile, it's still a car. Yeah. I love how it's just a car. <laughs> yeah. And but they go to... I think it's a different car though. It's not red. It's blue this time. It's blue this time. It looks closer to the Batmobile. It does look closer. I, I'll say that like um, the Batman Forever Batmobile actually has a lot of these same lines. Mm -hmm. It's just they're in the in like morphed a little bit. So they they drive to Fred Walker's house because mm -hmm. they know he has motive as well. 
and they're going to check up on him. Um, the house is empty and dark, um, and they open up the coat closet to look inside, and Brunner's dead, and he's hanging in there from a coat hook. Uh, he's not dead. Fred Walker? He says... Oh, he's dying. Yeah. Sorry. You're right. He says, Walker, can you uh, hear me? Uh, who did this to you? He's Clayface, Clayface. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so he's dying. And so now yeah. we know it's someone named Clayface. And then Batman goes, dead. Clayface, he said. So he, he died right then. Yeah. Oh, I guess Batman went by himself. Sorry, I messed yeah. that up. No, it's all good. I mean, Robin was with him, but they it looks like they split up. Right. Oh, I didn't read the text in the panel. I should have. It's fine. Uh, Robin stays at the studio to check out check things out there. Mm-hmm. So meanwhile, this is parallel. Robin's like climbing around the castle uh, and the set. And he's looking for, you know, suspicious activity or whatever. And he happens upon the dude in the purple suit. And the, the dude in the purple suit, Clayface. We, we, we know it's Clayface. We know it's Clayface. Yes. Leaps and, and is, tries to kill Robin yeah. with, a, with a dagger. And Robin is kind of like reflexes. He ducks out of the way. They fight a little bit more. Uh, he grabs him by the arm. Mm-hmm. He's like dragging him out. And he throws him off the top of the castle into the moat below. So like Clayface bests Robin. I think it's really funny that this movie set and there's like a three four three story castle. Yeah, well this is back when movie sets like were a little bit more they spared like, no expense. Real, yeah. <laughs> there's some like really really crazy movie sets in the his- in history. But I love that like Robin falls into the moat and Batman is kind of over seeing this body fall into the water. He goes, "That looks that's that's Robin." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he's just gotten back from checking in on Walker just in time to see, yeah, Robin fall into. And, yeah. and so Batman goes and rescues him, pulls him out of the water. Yeah. And he says, are you all right, kid? And Robin says, uh, I guess so. Wow. What hit me? Oh, now I remember the monster up in the tower. Uh, so it's kind of interesting the way this is written, too, because Batman knew it was Clayface and the reader knew it was Clayface. Yeah. So we call him Clayface in the book. Mm-hmm. But Robin didn't know his clay face yeah. yet. See, that's, well, that word has no, that name has no meaning to him. Right. And so he says that monster up in the tower. Yeah. So I, I, I like how they're making all that clear to us that like, mm-hmm. we know things Robin doesn't know. Yeah. Because we saw what happened to Batman and mm-hmm. we're moving forward. It's interesting because they're shooting a monster movie and he's kind of like the monster. Yeah. Right? So yeah, that's just, a good call too. Yeah, parallel. And Carlo disappears, right? Clayface disappears. They don't know where he is. And we, we have a little cut to him like talking to himself. Once more, I don the garments of death. This morning, Julie begins her murder scene in the Dread Castle. Perhaps it shall be proved prophetic. So then, yeah, we're shooting the movie again. They're continuing, which I, like, if multiple people are dying on the set, like, I don't know why you would keep shooting the movie. Oh, well, especially if the last person died on, like, a, in a, or I guess the first person died in a murder scene that they were yeah. filming. Yeah, like, they're going to do least it again. Maybe don't film murder scenes until you figure something out. Well, they are not smart, so they're going to see, you know, the hunchback is going to kill Julie. Um, yeah, I don't even know why Julie would even agree play to do this, it. agree to do this because she was so stressed and she was saying to Bruce, like, I'm going to be next. I know it. Yeah. Right. So now, so she's not smart either. Right. But Batman and Robin are here this time, which like, it, it's a little weird. Bruce was the one that had the conversation with the head of Argus Studios, not Batman. So I don't know how they got in, like they had permission to be here or whatever. Maybe oh, they sure. in. And they're just ready for him. So we've, uh, this really bothers me. We've done all this whodunit, right? The murder mystery. Who could it be? Right, and we actually, he doesn't do any detect work. They don't actually do any figuring it out. They just, so it's Scooby-Doo. It's at yes. the end, they just like pull the mask off. They just happen to be there when, when they're going to murder Julie, and yeah. he intervenes. Like he sees sees him about to like throw like a throwing dagger at Julie. And he yeah, die, own. Julie. Yep, and he just kind of jumps in, and they fight for a few pages. Mm-hmm. Robin, you know, gets his revenge. Yeah, here's something I owe you. And he socks him in the face. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then they string him up. He gets him in a bat rope. And they pull him up, uh, you know, to the second level of, a, of the castle. They, they're they like, now we're going to find out who you are. And they take his ma- uh, makeup off. They remove the ghastly makeup from the horrible clay face, whose real face belongs to... It's Basil Carlo. Basil Carlo. Says Robin. He had played so many horror roles in pictures that they had taken possession of his mind and soul. He made up his clay face one of his old roles, and then followed the plot of the Dread Castle and killed off each one as they died in the picture. So he's just embittered. Yeah. Which is a cool idea, but, um, you know, <laughs> I have to say it's not the most satisfying end. That's pretty much it. It's a short one. Short and sweet. Yeah. It's not, I mean, again, lots and lots and lots of text. <laughs> they did a lot of, like, telling you instead of showing you. Yeah. In this one, and, and it, and it um, smells of golden age because of, like, the delivery and how... Yeah simple it was ham-fisted and like you were saying like they set up this whole mystery but they didn't do any detectiving yeah mystery so um but at the same time like these are these are aimed at kids 
Sure. So there's there's intrigue for you. Mm -hmm. You have to. You're wondering who the killer is. Is Batman, Robin, maybe not so much. I don't know. Yeah. They they do chase down some leads, and and I should say, in the last couple panels here, um, they they do try to tie off loose, loose ends. The the head of Argus asks, "Why did he kill Walker?" And he said, "Carlo answers," which I think is really funny. They always sort of monologue and they they confess everything. He says, yeah. "He recognized me in my disguise when I, when I killed Lorna, so he wanted to blackmail me." Which is funny. He didn't turn him into the police or anything. Yeah. Try to get money from him or something. I don't know. And so that's why I killed him because he knew who I was. And then the head of Argus says, "Like, you, if you want to be actors in movies, Batman and Robin, stop by any time." Yeah, let me know. That's cool. Sorry, our careers are constant battle against crime and evil. So they say no. Yeah. There. Oh, I. <laughs> yeah. Is this Julie or is this Robin? It's probably Robin who says this. They're what I. Oh, it's no. Julie. This, this is Julie. Yeah. They're what I call a pair of real heroes, and I don't mean. Real, R E E L. <laughs> you know. Ho hum. If only Bruce was so dashing. So, that's Clayface. <laughs> and I, I didn't read Detective Forty Nine, but from what I understand, it's really similar. Similar. Sure. Carlo continues to be upset about you know the fact that he's not getting roles. Yeah. He kills people, and then he's foiled, and doesn't show up again until the sixties. Interestingly, he's in the Batman nineteen sixty six um, animated intro. So there's a, you know, while the theme music is playing, they have, you know, drawings of all the characters sort of moving past the camera. Clayface is there. He never appears on the show. Really? But yeah, so. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, not a part, important part of the Golden Age is revived in the 60s. I think really comes into focus and you get fans of the character in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm sure we'll come back and do more stories, but. Yeah, I mean, it's like a lot of these ideas have to percolate before they like land on the, the character, the version sure. of the character that people like. And I, I agree that like the clay face of the like '90s is, I think, the one that we're gonna continue to see. Totally. Because they they figured out the format or the f form, mm -hmm. no pun intended, um, that works well. There was totally unfounded rumors that I want to be true that like maybe we'd see Clayface in, in the Matt Reeves Batman sequel. I think that would be really cool, but we'll see if they stay more grounded or if they do more fantastic. Yeah, they've yeah. stayed pretty grounded so far, yeah. but well, we shall see. I'm really curious what they're gonna do. Anything else before we go? No, I don't think so. That's a good one. Yeah, we got to get dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Barbecue. Thanks for listening and or watching. Hopefully that recorded. Hey, Bat Family. We're throwing up the Bat Signal. If you made it this far, we hope you liked the show. If you put a like on the video, it'll help us find more Cape Crusaders. And if you subscribe, you'll never miss a future episode. Drop a comment down below telling us what we got wrong. Or you can head on over to batlessons.com and write us an email or send us a voice memo. We'll talk about your feedback on a future episode of the show. That's also where you can find show notes and transcripts for every episode and links to all of our social media. Thanks for listening.